Good evening. How's everybody doing? Man, I, uh, I'm a little frazzled. Um, y'all know about the 50 being shut down? Man, oh man. I was, it took me 50 minutes to get here. That is no joke. That is not even an exaggeration. So I am frazzled. But it's not about me. It's about God's word. And let's just pray and ask God just to, uh, to help me preach his word tonight and give me clarity. God, you know my heart right now. You know how I'm a little overwhelmed. But God, may you just use the study we've had together to encourage the saints here today. God, use your word to strengthen them and encourage them. Use my words to um, just convict and, and to um, just arouse attention. Um, God, may I get any of my sinful pride out of the way. And God, would you speak through me for your glory and your name's sake, for the church to be unified as a whole. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Our text today is going to be in Romans 1, so if you would like to turn there to Romans 1, that would be awesome. And um, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, you guys are talking about community group. Now, this is pretty cool. Um, I was given freedom just to talk on whatever I want about building community, or at least I believe so, because if not, then I'm going to have a talking to. And... Um, I'm not going to just talk to you guys about what is community, because I believe that that was already addressed, right? And did you guys address why it's important? Okay, great, perfect. So we don't even need to go into that. Um, <clears throat> but I'll just give you a little review. I wasn't here, but I'm pretty sure we believe the same thing. Uh, the church is not meant for the individual, right? The purpose of God's global call, the, the, the uh, purpose of uh, God's glory throughout the whole world is going to be most Perfectly achieved by the saints coming together as one, being unified, building and stirring each other up for that main purpose, that main goal of glorifying God throughout the world, right? Um, God has accomplished much more with the church than he has with the individual. And so community is essential. I, I, I always say this to my students. Um, there's four primary ways, and there's other ways, but four primary ways in which God grows the Christian. One is the word of God, two is prayer, three is trials, and four is the most neglected, and that is church. Or at least the most misunderstood, church. <clears throat> I know many people who go to churches uh, for their youth group, and then they come to main service at another church. I know that some people go to worship service at one church, go to hear a sermon at another church, go serve in the youth at another church, and then go to youth, uh, go to like youth events or camps or whatever at another church. You are confused. And you have no idea what the church is and what your job is in that local church. <clears throat> And we're talking about community. Uh, community groups is that uh, we're not just here to hear a sermon, right? But we go out into each other's lives and some other day of the week, I believe you guys don't do it on a Sunday. Do you guys do it on a Sunday or another day? Other days? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so on another day, you guys are in each other's lives and you might go through some time, uh, time of the word. But this is your time to really dig deep in each other's lives. And I'll tell you this. <clears throat> Can I get water? One thing that I've learned as a Christian is that I'm lazy and that I'm selfish. And when I hear that church, hey guys, we're meeting for church um, this week, blah, blah, blah. And I've had an exhausting week. My wife had a baby just recently. Dope, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's pretty awesome, but also exhausting. Um, and so we're exhausted. Well, mainly her. I'm sleeping while she's, you know, going. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's exhausting, and, you know, we hear, hey, you got a deacon's meeting tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, no. Even though I love the deacon's meetings, I'm just exhausted from it, right? I'm exhausted from all my other work, but sometimes we think, okay, well, I'm going to go to community group. I'm going to go to a Bible study because, well, if I don't, then people are going to think I'm not spiritual, or I'm just like, you know, not godly, or just, oh, fine, I'll have to go. That's a really terrible reason to go. 
Some of you, okay, I'll give you an example. Um, my wife and I, uh, when we were not even dating, we were not even anything. I liked her, and I didn't know if she liked me, but she's way out of my league, so I was going to do whatever I could to get my face in front of her, you know, um, and woo her. And, like, my friends would be like, hey, man, you want to hang out? And I'd be like, no, man, I'm kind of tired. They'd be like, all right, well, Samantha's here. And be like, hey, man, I'll be there in five minutes. Hold up. Let me just get my clothes on real quick. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Men, you know what I'm talking about. Like, oh, wait, they're going to be there? Okay, I'll go. You know, and you're like, oh, what? You didn't? So anyways, like, uh, that happens all the time, right? Um, And by the way, that happens with a lot of Christians. One of the main reasons why they come to church, even, or Bible studies or community groups, is just for someone of the opposite sex, which is a terrible reason. And we'll get into that later. But when my wife, well, when the girl that I liked was at a certain location, I wanted to be there, okay? Let me give you a case in point, how bad it was. It's really pathetic. It's actually really sad. So me and my wife, we went to the same Bible college, and it's like two miles away from where I live, right? My car is broke down. Can't get it fixed, and uh, Samantha's like, hey, I'm at the library all by myself. And I was like, "Uh, well... That sucks. Uh, I wish I was there and we could hang out. She was like, why don't you come? I said, because uh, my car's broken. She was like, why don't you run? I said, okay. And I didn't tell her. I started running. I ran to the library. It's two miles. My fat butt can't run two miles. I was like, whew, whew. it was more panting than there was running. But like when she was leaving, because she didn't know I was coming there, she was getting into her car and I went, wait. I did whatever I could to be around my wife because, let me just be honest, that's what I'm interested in, right? I was totally interested in that at the time. What I'm saying is what your heart desires most will drive you. And with community groups, a lot of us are not meeting together because we don't see the value in it because our hearts aren't in it. And our hearts are somewhere else in a place where it shouldn't be. You get what I'm saying by that? You get what I'm saying? Our hearts should be driven towards community if our hearts are driven towards Christ. And the very reason why we are not driven towards community is solely that reason. Thank you. It's solely that reason. Our hearts were meant for community. Our hearts were meant for each other. And so I know that many of us are lazy. I know many of us struggle with wanting to go to community groups. It's, listen, you're off of work, some of you. You just got done with school. You have a stressful life. You might have kids at home. What is going to make you say, I'm going to be there? We're going to talk about that today. In Romans 1, verse 8 through 15, it's our text this evening, and we're going to be t- looking at the heart that Paul has for the Romans. Let's read this together. Verse 8 of Romans 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, and that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. So that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I want you to think about this language used here. Paul says, I am eager to be with you and I'm eager to preach to you. I've been prevented thus far, but listen, don't. Think that I'm not trying. Paul has never met these Roman believers. 
He's never met them. He's only heard about them. But there's something that causes Paul to say, I will do whatever it takes to get near them. Saints, is this our hearts this evening? Do we have this connection, this desire to be with the flock, to, to be so eager to meet with one another that if we've been prevented, we want to make it known and that we want to tell them, hey, it's not because I haven't tried. I did whatever I could to be here. I am so sorry. I've been longing for this fellowship. I hope and pray that we will learn from Paul's example of what it means to really desire community. Desire community, because that's what we're talking about this evening. In this text, 8 through 15, there's three things that causes Paul to desire this community. Number one is their faith. They are united in their faith. Number two, they are united in their prayers. And number three, they are united in in their needs. Let me say that again. There's three things that drives Paul's desire for community, and that is that they are united in their faith, they are united in his prayers, and they are united in their needs. Now let's look at the first section, that they are united in their faith. So what is Paul, what is driving Paul to want to be with these believers? Let's look at that in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness how unceasingly I make mention of you. There's something that stirs Paul's heart to even write to these Roman believers. And that is their faith in Christ. Their faith in Christ. Now Paul has connected to these believers with this very same thing. He has a faith in Christ, a love for Christ that really just hops out the page. Let's look at the first verse of this chapter. Why don't we do that? The first verse says, Paul, a bond servant of Christ Jesus. Let's just stop right there. Paul identified himself as a bond servant. Now, you've heard this a thousand and a half times, most likely, that the word bond servant is the word in Greek, doulos. And that word means slave, but it means so much more than that. It means someone who willfully gives his rights to another, who says, I have no rights to myself, no rights to my own life. You have it all, and I rightfully, I, I willfully give my rights to you. Now, what would cause Paul to really do such a thing? Well, isn't it the gospel message? Isn't it who Christ is, that he came into this earth and he died on the cross, and was buried, but he resurrected and was declared the Son of God by power of the resurrection. You see, Paul has said it many times, for him to live is what? Christ and to die is what? See, Paul, his life was about Christ. He saw himself, by the way, what's the next thing Paul says about himself? He says he's called as an apostle. Now, this is important as he's writing to the Romans because this was to be of authority, right? This was to give his words backing. Look, you can trust my words because I'm an apostle. I'm sent personally by Jesus Christ with a message, right? Now, you would think if you're going to establish some sort of authority, you would start with being an apostle. But you see, before even apostle, being an apostle, Paul saw himself first and foremost a slave to Jesus. Because Jesus was his life. Amen? Can you deny it? Can you read from the scriptures and be like, I don't really believe that about Paul? No, when we look at the scriptures, it is obvious Paul lived for Christ. And he died for Christ, did he not? Paul saw himself a minister of the gospel, enslaved to the gospel, if you will. His purpose in his life was to preach that good news which saved him. What did Paul live for? 
Christ. What was his purpose? Christ. What was his job? It was all about Christ. Whether he had much or whether he had little, it was all about Christ. Am I beating a dead horse? And this is what unites Paul with the Romans. It is Christ. See, Paul is in one pursuit, and that is Jesus. And when he sees, and let me give you, when he sees the Romans over here pursuing Jesus, he's like, huh? And it brings his attention over to them. Let me give you an example real quick of this. You know, I hate, um, I hate dating in America. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And then I hate how Christians try to mold it and say, oh, I'm not dating. I'm courting. Shut up. You're dating. It's just use a different term, okay? And then, and then they say, oh, my parents say we can't date, so we're going to go on double dates, so it's not officially a date. Shut up. Just shut up, okay? You're dating, all right? Now, here's the thing. I always get this all the time from so many people. Uh, how can I pursue Christ in my relationship? Well, here's the thing. Um, you're not supposed to pursue them ever, 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 until you get married. And then when you come to Jesus, you say, Jesus, I want to serve you. And he goes, okay, serve your wife. And you're like, okay, boom. That's it. But you're never, your, your pursuit even isn't your wife at that time. It's still Christ. And you pursue your wife because Christ tells you to. But so many people go, I just don't get it how it works. Like, we're struggling a lot with keeping the Lord number one. Yeah, because she's your idol and you're her idol. You're pursuing each other. What it should be is you're pursuing Christ and they're pursuing Christ. And you're on this, you know, you're on this race together. And you look over and you go, hey, what the? What are you doing here? And they're like, uh, what, are you, what are you doing here? And you're like, I'm running after Christ. What about you? Me too. Well, you're kind of cute. Yeah, you're not, but what, you're, the, you're no one else around here. So, And so you get together and you run this race together, right? Well, Christians, that's community. It's like my pursuit is Jesus, right? And you see someone else pursuing Jesus, you're like, dude, no way. This is a true story. I'm not even kidding, okay? We look for commonalities, right? We look for bond, do we not? Like when you're in high school or, or when you're in elementary school, you know, you, you meet a friend and you're just like, hey, my name's Dave and I like bugs. And some other kid's like, my name's Jim and I like bugs. And you become best friends over something stupid like bugs, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? There's a connection. There's a connection like... And people always say this, like, oh, dude, we're just not compatible. We like the different music. We like, it's just so stupid, right? I remember one time I was in Cleveland. Now, Cleveland is not a very um, safe place. Um, <laughs> it's not a very nice place. And I went in, so um, my wife's family, okay, my wife is black. Her whole side of her family's black. We go to church, and we go to a black church. Um, and I'm, like, standing out. Um, I'm like the you know, the Q-tip. I'm just like, boop, you know, just in the, in the audience. And I look over to my left, and there's some one other white dude. And I was like, <laughs> son of a man. He was like, right on, right on. We had a connection. We had a connection. By the way, that dude was a teacher. Even more of a connection. It was just great. Best friends. We look for things to unite us, right? But oftentimes, they're very trivial and meaningless, right? Like skin color, like music, like, like um, hobbies. But understand this. Christians, the very thing that united Paul with the Romans was Christ Jesus himself. That we were dead and raised to life. That we are given the savior of our souls. That we're given the God of the universe to fellowship with it and to enjoy. That is our treasure. And we met someone else who also has the same treasure and who loves them just as much as we do, if not more. What a great thing this is for community. The very thing I'm pursuing. Now listen, all these other little things, like they're trivial, but this is life. This is everything. Jesus is all and in all. He is the God of the universe. He's the pinnacle of creation. He's everything. And I know people who love him like me. That's dope. And people who have been you know, uh, hated because of his namesake. Me too. That's awesome. 
But you know how Christians react sometimes? I swear, this is just insane to me. How, you know, when I was a Christian, when I first got saved, no one really was following Christ around me. Seriously, it was like wishy-washy Christians. And then there was Christians who just hated me. Christians who hated me. And then when I met a Christian who's like, loved Jesus, who got Jesus like I did, I was like, this is awesome. And we were like best friends. We are best friends. This is the great news that Jesus Christ not only saved us, but he saved me and a bunch of others around me to encourage me, to bless me. This is awesome. Imagine I was on a desert island. Imagine I was on a desert island. Uh, Y'all seen Castaway? Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, stuck in an island, right? Some dude stuck in an island and... uh, Okay, so he's on this island, and, you know, he's, he has to figure everything, else, uh, everything out, and he's on there for, like, five years, um, and he finally gets, like, rescued off, right? And you see the boat flickering, you know, in the distance, and he's like, hey, hey, you know, any sign of hope, he gets crazy. Now, just imagine you're on this island for a year, and then all of a sudden you see someone else on the island. You wouldn't go, how's it going? And just move on. You wouldn't even say, wow, that's crazy. There's someone else on this island. But gosh, they're annoying. Why, of all people on this island, just this guy? This guy? No, you'd be like, what? This is awesome. Come on over, dude. And you'd hang out all the time. Because no one else is around you, number one. But no one else in the world gets what you get. Now, here God has plucked you out of the world. You're an outcast. You're you're set apart. The word church, ecclesia, means called out ones. Here you are called out of the world, and here you are, okay, I'm all by myself. And the sad thing is you go, hey, all these people in my church, I can't believe I get to be around believers. You go, hey, man, let me tell you about Jesus. And they're like, calm down a little bit. Too much. And you look like a psycho because you want to talk about Christ. This is the church. Let me just say this. This is just honest. The church is not about community because the church is not about Christ. Let me say that again. And it's going to be harsh. I don't really care because it's true. People meet my friend meets for this um, soccer club. First of all, if you like soccer, doubt your salvation. Number, that's number one. Number two um, is this, this, this soccer club. Um, that, that, that it's like a Liverpool, something like that. And they, like, they chant, they do all this weird stuff. But they all meet to watch a pointless game. And they, they're all like, hey, and they chant, they do their little dances. And I'm like, man, this is lame. But there are so many people who love that. If you're like, what? Just question yourself. Now, um, think about that for a second. It's really lame, but Christians, we can't even k- get together on a weekly basis, but they can get together over something so lame as soccer. We have the God of the universe in common. We have eternal life in common, and we're just like, eh. You do not care about community because you do not care about Christ. That might hurt. I do not care. That's the truth. When you love Christ and you know others who love Christ, you will want to meet with them because they have what you want. They have Christ. Does that make sense? You won't want to meet. Look, if Christ is not your goal and you know these people are about Christ, the number one thing you won't want to do is meet with them. Let me, let me tell you why I know this. I, whenever I have my, I've discipled students over the years, whenever I know a student is not following the Lord, I know this because they do not talk to me. But when they're following the Lord, they always call me up. Because they know my heart is about Christ and they want to talk to someone about it. And that's what Paul was about. This is what unites them, Christ and Christ alone. He hears, he's preaching the gospel to the Corinthians, and he hears from afar that the Romans, are, their faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world, and he's like, yes! This is awesome! And he says, I gotta, I gotta meet you. I gotta be with you. I just gotta, I gotta instruct you. I gotta teach you. 
He hasn't even been with the Romans yet, and he's writing the book of Romans. The longest epistle we have in the New Testament where he's just going on and on about the glories of Christ because he found someone who loves Christ. By the way, let's just, let me just look at this real quick. Can we go to verse one again? This is how you know how excited he is about talking about Jesus. He says, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was the born of the descendant of David, according to the flesh, who is declared the son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. I said that fast for a reason. Paul hasn't even gotten into his main thing in which he's addressing, and that is in verse 7, grace and peace to you. Paul says, hey, I'm Paul. Hello? That's one through seven. Understand this. Two, three, four, five, and six are all about Christ and about what the gospel's all about. He's just like, hey, I'm Paul, and I'm meant to preach the gospel. Oh, and, and the gospel, and the gospel, and the gospel. And he goes on and on and on and on because you know why Paul cares about the gospel? And then he finds others who care about the gospel, and he's like, this is awesome. Let me tell you about it for 16 chapters. Paul not only is eager to talk about Christ because Christ is on his heart, he wants more of Christ. That's the question I have for you this evening is not just uh, do you want to come to community group because God tells you to. But do you want to because you get more of what you crave, what you long for, and that is Christ? Do you want to meet with each other because each other, each one of you has what I'm looking for? I'm not complete within myself that I need the body of Christ to build me up, to correct me, to encourage me, to rebuke me, to strengthen me in any way that I can get more of my Lord. It's very simple. If you're just not caring about community right now, it's extremely, extremely simple. You do not care about Christ right now. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're lazy, selfish, sinful, and I'm the president and CEO of that club. And we all need to repent. You're not alone, but it's not excused. Christ deserves much more. And Christ unites us. This is the greatest bond that we can have. Now, by the way, I'm going I'm to stress this real quick. And man, we haven't even gotten to point number two. I don't even, what time do I got to get out of this thing? 12? Good. All right. No, early. What time? 9.45. <laughs> okay. Let me tell you this. <laughs> Not going to happen. Number two, um, let me say this about community. Here's the number one thing that happens with community, and this is why people get upset uh, about why they don't. Um, I don't go to community because, you know, it's just like the music sucks. Okay. Um, no. Okay. Number two, we just don't have fun, you know? I mean, like, I used to have fun with my old church group. We don't have fun. You know, fun? Fun? And they make it like, Fun has to be the main thing. We, 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 we make it like, oh, you know, we just don't hang out. We don't talk anymore. We don't have jam sessions, you know? We just don't just like, you know, feel the presence. of You know what I'm saying? Like, they make it something more than Christ. Like, Christ is not enough. And listen, if Christ is not the center of, if you're looking at the, the, the community group and say, well, there's no games. I'll just tell you this. It's going to take very little to keep you away from that community group. You know what I'm saying by that? If the main thing you're pursuing in each other is fun, it's going to take very little to say, someone to say, hey, man, you want to hang out? I have a community group tonight. Come on, man, this will be fun. Okay. Done. But if somebody says, Man, I got community group tonight. I'm so excited to be in the Word and just to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're like, hey, man, you want to hang out tonight? It's going to be fun. Uh, I would, but I'm going to be pursuing Christ in the community group. Hey, would you like to come? Because I would love to fellowship with you, bruh. And you'll see how things work together. It's just the reality. But you have to have the same thing in common. Christ has to be the main thing. Turn to 1 Corinthians real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this. For I determined 
to know nothing among you except Christ and him what? Crucify. Christ and him crucify. What did Paul desire to know among the Corinthians? Christ and him crucified. And then he hears while he's serving the Corinthians about the Romans and he hears about their faith and the only thing he discusses with them is Christ and him crucified. Now, the, I know your jump here is that, oh, so you're saying uh, as believers we can never talk about anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified? No, you legalistic, arrogant person. The only reason why you would even say that is because to really understand what Christ is, what Paul is saying here, you have to, you have to understand that Christ is everything. This is his life. And the radical implications is re the reality is he is everything. He is your life. And fun becomes down here. But immediately people go, oh, well, no, that's legalistic. No, you're lazy, dude. You're lazy. You're selfish, dude. It's not legalistic to say Christ is everything. Tell me how that's legalistic. You're saying no fun. Did I say no fun? Is Christ not pleasure embodied himself? Are you saying we can't have any fun playing games? Just get over it. Get over it. Does that not reveal something about your heart? The reason why I'm beating this dead horse is because this is what we all struggle with. We pursue the, the little things in life and not the only thing in life. We say, what about my rest? What about my fun? What about my pleasure? What about this? It's, listen, 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 listen. I don't think you know this. <laughs> when God created the universe, he didn't create you and say, well, I don't have to worry about anything else for the rest of eternity. You know we fell, right? Did you know that? Did you know that we needed a savior, right? And you know that he restored us by Jesus Christ, by taking our sin, putting it, on, putting it on himself, resurrecting from the dead, giving us new life so that we could get plugged back into God. Not God into us. Not God into us. And that is crucial. Because community is not about you. It's about the glory of Christ. See, Christ has to be the purpose and Christ has to be the motivation. Christ has to be everything. Community groups are about Christ and they will only survive if we are about Christ. Does that make sense? Not if you get me. Some of you. The rest of you are asleep. Okay. Now, next point. For the sake of time. Paul is being united with these believers in prayer. We see this. Let's go back to the text first. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Paul is not only united with the Romans by faith, but Paul is united with the Romans in prayer, and this is absolutely essential. It does not mean that we are praying um, together and just holding hands, even though that is a great unification process, and that is great for us to just be bonded, right, in that same goal and that same purpose. But Paul is just praying for their needs. Paul is praying for these believers, not just for their needs, but just thanking them. And that's, let's look at that first. Paul has a prayer of thanksgiving, and that's why they are united. Paul is thanking God for them. Now, as Paul is, continues um, to see the saints um, in Rome, their, to see their ministry, there is this, this thankfulness that wells up inside of him. This wells up inside of him. He is just um, just more thankful for these believers because Paul knows that he cannot do this by himself. 
If we go back to that first verse again in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. See, Paul was not only a slave to Christ, but he also was a messenger for Christ. And the message, the, the message he was given was the gospel, and he would go out and share it to the Gentiles, as we see in verse 5, that he was called to bring about the obedience of faith to the Gentiles. Now, as Paul would minister these, to these Gentiles, from town to town, he would get beaten, he would get flogged, he would get hated. He would, there, was a lot of, there was riots that happened pretty consistently in Paul's ministry. Paul understood that he preached the gospel and made disciples so that others could get saved and continue this global call. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that God is not just concerned with our walk with him, and our ministry, but the ministry of the global church and the local church. Let me say that again. Paul is not just concerned with you and your ministry, but God is concerned with the global call of the church and the local call of the church. Now, what do I mean by that? Paul is not assuming that he is the only one God is focused on. Like, Paul is the only one who's really preaching the gospel. That God's name and glory is being proclaimed solely through this man, Paul. Because if that were, what a depressing thought that would be. That God saved Paul to preach the gospel to let people know about the glory of God. And how it came down onto this earth. And gave us new life to be drawn to him. God gave Paul a purpose to preach the gospel. But Paul, as he looks across this sinful world, man, he knows utterly this is not, I cannot do this by myself. I am utterly helpless to do this work on my own strength. I need God. I need someone else. I need a team. I need someone with me. See, Paul, like we said before, is all about Jesus Christ, right? And he sees others who are proclaiming Jesus Christ. It's just, he gets so thankful. Number one, we would be thankful because God is using others. Man, I'm, I'm telling you, it, preaching is exhausting. Not because it's physically exhausting, which it is. You can see the sweat coming down my back right now. It's exhausting. What's more exhausting? It's looking out into the crowd and seeing unaffected faces. It's seeing people who don't care. What's even worse than that is hanging out with those people who don't care. In other words, you feel like helpless. You feel weak. And, and honestly, sometimes when that happens, we feel useless. Like, we haven't done anything. But when you see others preaching the gospel, and when you see others pointing others to Christ, and when you see testimony over testimony over testimony of people who have influenced each other's lives, it only causes the saints to rejoice. Well, it should. Dang. It should, it should if my heart is about Christ. If my heart is about Christ, if my goal is about Christ, if my love and my pursuit is about Christ, then when I see others proclaiming Jesus Christ, I rejoice because Christ is being glorified. And I thank my God. Christians, was the last time you thanked each other, thanked God for each other is what I'm saying. That you looked at each other's ministry and that you praise God for them. That you say, man, I'm just, I'm not just praying about your needs. I'm thanking God because God is doing a work in you and through you to me and to others. And I am so glad God's great name is being praised today. Man, isn't that what we want? Look, the reason why I'm even saying this is we need each other. 
because it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about God's global call for his glory. Amen? It is about the glory of God. Whether you see that or not, that's the main thing. It's about God's glory through Jesus Christ to sinners that they could be saved. That is our purpose. That is our life. That is our hope. That is our joy. That is everything to us. And sadly, we focus on the stupidest things with each other. We're community. We say we're not going to we're not going to come to community because you know they don't have fun there. They don't have the right music there. They don't have the right people there. It's the same thing with each other, right? Not just community group, but just with each other. We focus on the most insignificant things and we just complain about each other all the time. About each other's clothes, hair, tone, breath, outfit. How many times they said Father God in their prayer. How long they prayed. How many times they mentioned. How many times they had to raise their hand in discussion groups. We get so annoyed by political group. Man, you post too much on Instagram. You don't post enough on Instagram. You know what I mean? Like we get, we complain about the stupidest stuff, the most trivial things, and we're missing the main thing. Maybe you're not going to community group because. You're so focused on everyone else's problems that you can't even see your own problem. And you can't even see that the solution to that problem is in that community group. Did you get what I said there? Maybe you're so focused on everyone else's problems you can't see that you have the biggest problem. And the solution to that problem is in that community group. You need them. Paul hasn't been with them and he thanks God for them because of their faith in Christ. He's not looking at anything else their faith in Christ. Now, the Roman church has problems. Just read 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They have problems. But that's not his issue right here. He doesn't talk about the problem. He says, I thank my God for you, for your faith. Look, everyone in this room has problems. Problems with paying attention. Problems with gossip, problems with laziness, problems with selfishness, problems with arrogance, problems with lust, insignificant problems. All of us do. We need to understand. We need to get past those things and understand everyone has the same problem here but we all have the same solution. Let's be united in that solution. Stop picking on each other. Stop being grossed out because of the nerdy guy in the group. Or, or, or the guy who's just super awkward. Get over it. Like, who are you? I'll tell you who you are. Someone whose heart is not on Christ, but on yourself. Because everyone needs to fix their life for you. But you're not God. And the point of community group is to say, let's come together and deal with these issues for the glory of God. Paul. Not only praise 
for them and thanks God for them. But he is praying without ceasing. I want you to think about this. He's praying without ceasing so that he can be with them. He's praying without ceasing so he can be with them. Oh, man, okay, since you're all college age, I'm going to tell you something that I hear too many times with college age people. Um, I don't have time for church because I work. I don't have time for church because I have school. Or the churches in my area suck. Dude, if your pursuit is Christ, you'll be with the saints. And Paul was like, God, please, can I come see them? Please, can I come see them? Please, 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 please. And then God answered, and then uh, it, it didn't turn out so well for Paul. But the point is, Paul was eager to meet with the saints. Now, let's go real quickly. Let's give a sidetrack because that, that heart of Paul, that's attainable if we're pursuing Christ, right? Did, did, we, did I clarify that enough? <laughs> if, yeah, no. Uh, if Christ is not the focus, we're not going to be eager to meet with each other. But because Christ was the focus, he was like, I got to be with you. I got to be with you. I got to be with you, God. Please, 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 please. And then God lets him, right? So we can go into that. But let's just talk about praying for each other and our needs, right? Praying for each other's needs. Listen, if you know, like I said, okay, when you get around community group, um, you're going to see more sin in people than you, than you would on Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying about that? And the tendency is to gossip and to slander those people. Imagine every time you sinned, every time you sinned, you just said, failure, failure, failure. Just imagine, every single time you did, first of all, we'd just be walking around all day, failure, 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 right? We'd just be speaking in tongues all the way to work and in the cars, the same failure. It's the only word on our mind because we're sinning all the time, right? But just imagine every time, or every time someone looked at you and you, and they know whatever, you sin, you would hear them all say, failure. That would be terrible, right? And it wouldn't do any good. But when we get to community group, literally what we're doing is just going, failure, failure, failure. I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that, and I don't like that. Listen, okay, either pray for them with those issues, or shut up. Seriously. It's not about you. And if I get in trouble for saying shut up, I know I will, but still. Dude, please, I'll say it one more time. Okay, sorry. Shut up. Like, seriously, like, this world is about you. Like, where did we get so high and mighty? You understand you asked for forgiveness because you couldn't save yourself, right? You literally said... I can't do this on my own. I need you, Jesus. And then you got Jesus and you went, <laughs> look at all you. You need Jesus. Yes, they do. And so do you. But this is the reality. We are so, so arrogant. You believe in Black Lives Matter? I don't even know if you're safe. You believe homosexuality is not a sin? I don't think we can be friends. I use that example because that has happened to me in community. Where I've been like, oh, to Betsy because I'm so shocked that this theological brother of mine who's gone to Bible college has said that he believes homosexuality is not a sin. Now, does that mean that I leave that unaddressed? Absolutely not. It does that mean that I just go, <laughs> heathen? No. It means I say, you need Jesus 
I need Jesus. Let's bear with one another, be unified in the gospel, and deal with this thing. But instead, it's just like, I can't deal with you. Don't you understand Jesus saved me from you? You're not, you're not what you think you are. I love a quote by Charles Patton Spurgeon. He said, do not be offended if anyone calls you the devil because you're worse than that. And you are. And I am. But that doesn't mean we go to each other and someone says something, we go, you're the devil. And they'd be like, oh, and be like, you're worse than that. Just remember, Charles Spurgeon. No, it means that you, 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 you are worse than that. Yes, they are worse than that, but they don't need to hear that. They already know that. Bear with them. Pray for them. Pray. Guys, that's what I'm saying is that if we're united in the gospel, our pursuit is the gospel. So if we see someone who's not changed and conformed to the gospel, we don't just go, why aren't you conformed? We pray for them to be conformed. Right? You don't look at somebody who's... <laughs> you don't look at somebody who is not walking with Christ who has the ability to walk with Christ, and you know how to walk with Christ, and then look to that person and say, why aren't you walking with Christ? Teach them. Pray for them. Bear with them. Help them. Don't just look at them. Don't just scoff at them. Don't just gossip about them. That's your brother. That's your sister. And that's the person you need to keep you focused on Christ. And the moment you scoff and put them down and look just ill at them, your focus no longer is Christ. Lastly, they are united by need. I'm already over time. Thank you. I'm gonna hear a couple things from you, huh? Shut up and the time. Let's go. Let's look. Verse 11. For I long to see you. Oh, I just want that so bad. So that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Isn't that great? Verse 12. That is that I may be encouraged together while with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith. Both yours and mine. Both yours in mind, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I have often uh, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. This is it. The Romans had a need, and Paul had a need. Paul had a need. He needed the spiritual gift, the fruit from the saints. He needed to minister. And he, sorry, he needed to minister and he needed to be ministered to. This all comes around full circle. If you see your need for Christ, and you see Christ is everything, you'll see the next thing, the next step on it, you'll see that you can't get him fully because you're a sinner. And then you have saints alongside of you who see your failures. And they pray for you. They lift you up. But not only that, they build you up. They not only ask for God's blessing, they give you God's word. They give you God's strength. They teach you about God. They tell you about what God has done in their life. 
I would not be here preaching if it wasn't for the saints who have ministered to me. Now, I want you to know something real quick. So many people go to church in order to hear a sermon, right? No, that's all well and good, and that's part of it. The church is supposed to be ministering to one another. You, the church, are supposed to be ministering to one another. So why we got to be in community group is because we're going to take that time and minister to one another. Take this fruit and say, I hope you enjoy this. I, I have benefited from God has blessed me with it. Take this. I hope that it helps you. And then they say, well, I have something for you too. And we're like, oh, this is great. And we're being fed. And we're being built up. And we're being strengthened. But you see, Paul saw himself with that need. That he was incomplete without the saints. Hear what I just said? That he was incomplete without the saints. That the saints built him up in a way that he would not love Christ as much unless, uh, 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 he, wouldn't love, he wouldn't love Christ as much if he didn't have the saints. But the saints gave him such a love for Christ that built him up more and more and more and more. Listen, you don't need to come to this church today or your community group or any other time when you're around the believers, don't just go in there um, expecting a blessing or expecting some fruit. You give the fruit. Teach them what it means or what it looks like to give the fruit because honestly, sometimes, guys, we don't even know how to do this until someone starts. You see this all the time when people come to church. It happens all the time. They go, well, I didn't like that sermon, and they pick apart the service, right? You guys have been there? Come on. You've been there? You come to church, and you're like, that sucked, this sucked, this sucked, not going back. Or, dude, they went on and on and on about that same subject. Super boring. Y'all don't want to admit this, but I will. It's like what I'm doing right now, right? Is that why it's so quiet? Because everyone's like, you're doing this right. We complain and we pick apart the service. We're like, it's not good enough and this and this and this. Listen, you are meant to be here to bless others. Church isn't for you. It isn't. It's to bless the body. And as you bless the body, guess what? You'll be blessed in return. You'll be encouraged in return. And you do it not because uh, uh, um, everyone else, you know, it just needs to hear something from you because you're so special. No. You are wanting to encourage people so that they would encourage you in return because you're not that great. Paul saw these things about himself. Number one, he saw that his pursuit was Christ, that his goal was Christ, and that others their goal was about Christ, so he wanted to be with them. Two, he was united in prayer with them. He prayed for them constantly. And so as they were on his mind all the time and thanking God for them, he constantly wanted to be around them. And number three, he said, I need you. I'm incomplete without you. I can't do this by myself. Not only can I not minister without you, I can't even love Christ the way I want to without you. Paul saw himself incomplete, so he needed the saints. Paul saw himself in love with Jesus, so he needed others who would do the same. And Paul saw himself as weak, so he needed the prayers and he needed to pray for others. Look, if you're united in prayer, if you're focused on Christ, and you see your need for each other, you will go to community group. I'm not going to try to convince you other than that. This is a fact. So, if you don't want to go to, if you don't want to, I'm sorry if I'm going to say this, if you don't want to go to community group, don't. If 
If you want Christ, go. Because he's there in all of you. And we need each other. Or else God would just save one of us and then put us like the Tower of Babel, sprinkle us out. He's placed us all together in this room for a purpose. May we honor that purpose and meet together for community, for his name's sake. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for this time to be in your word. I'm thankful for a saint like Paul whose fruit is even benefiting me today. What a crazy reality. Someone who pursued you thousands of years ago is affecting my life right now. Thank you for the saints. God, I pray that we would meet in community. Meet together because we need each other. We need more of you. We need more of Christ. We need more prayer. We need more words. We need more encouragement. We need more strength. We need you. God, I don't want games or even community to be the goal. Pray that Christ is the goal and community is the means to that goal. Community is the means to that goal.